Good evening, everyone. So thank you again for joining us today for our presentation. Today, as you can see, our topic for today is imaging considerations for the pediatric dental patient. So I'll give some time more for, for people to join in. And then when we have a good number, we'll start. So thank you for joining us. So we'll take a couple of minutes for more people to join. Then we'll start once we get a good number. So be patient a bit. Thank you. Welcome everyone to today's presentation. The title, as you can see, is Imaging Considerations for the Pediatric Dental Patient. So thank you for joining us this evening. So KAPD is an association for people who have a passion for pediatric uh, Dentistry, it's open basically to everyone, that is the specialists, general dentists, and students. So please feel free to join our association to advance the interests of pediatric dentistry in Kenya. So we'll give a couple of minutes more for more people to join. Then at around, I think, uh, 10 past, I'll introduce Dr. Opondo so that she can do her presentation. So just bear with us for a little bit more time. Thank you.
yeah, we are just about to start. We are giving a bit of time for people to join. Then we'll start shortly, any time from now. Yeah, so today we have Dr. Opondo, who is a consultant, oral and maxillofacial radiologist. She has a BDS from the University of Nairobi and an MSc in OMFR from South Africa. So I think she will explain to us she will explain to us what OMFR stands for. So without taking too much time, Dr. Opondo, Karibu Sana, you may continue. Thank you very much, Dr. Karen, for the welcome remarks. Um, I also take this opportunity to thank the Kenya of pediatric dentists for giving me a wonderful opportunity to speak on this platform. Uh, OMFR stands for Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, which is my qualification from UWC in South Africa. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again and welcome everybody. So uh, the ideal imaging world would uh, comprise imaging modalities that do not use, utilize ionizing radiation. That has not been realized to date, unfortunately. We are still utilizing ionizing radiation for many diagnostic procedures. And in the meantime, it is the responsibility of each and every clinician that either orders or performs radiological examination to protect themselves and the patients by reducing radiation burden and by keeping each and every exposure as low as reasonably achievable. So tonight I'll be discussing imaging considerations for the pediatric dental patient. And I'll also limit my uh, discussion to those diagnostic modalities that utilize ionizing radiation within the scope of the pediatric dental practice. Please confirm to me, Dr. Kerry, uh, whether you can see my slide and whether you can hear me well before I proceed further. Yeah, yes, I can be able to see and also I can be able to hear you. Yes, so you can continue. Okay, thank you very much once again. So radiographs are valuable aids in the oral health care of infants, children, adolescents, and individuals with special health care needs. We really cannot away with radiography if we are to offer the most uh, quality service to our patients. And dental radiology is a very high volume field, hence the need for the regulation we see so far. In, the, in Europe alone, uh, dental radiology accounts for about a third of the total number of radiological examinations that are performed. Uh, it is well known and documented that children are at higher risk from the detrimental effects of ionizing radiation. Uh, some studies report that um, children are more at risk by up to 10 times compared to middle-aged adults. And many epid epidemiological studies have also uh, proven the risk of brain, salivary, and thyroid gland tumors in relation to medical diagnostic imaging. The need for imaging it is, can only be determined by the clinician after performing a detailed history, clinical examination, and assessing the patient's vulnerability to environmental factors that affect oral health. 
So we cannot perform radiograph for every patient as a blank, not, never to be conducted routinely, but must be justified on a case-to-case -case basis. So the main indication for dental radiography is to diagnose oral diseases. Secondly, to evaluate uh, dental alveolar trauma and also to monitor dental and facial development and the progress of ongoing therapy in our patients. So the outline of my discussion today will entail uh, an overview of radiation biology, whereby I'm going to lay a foundation for what I'm going to discuss tonight. And I'll also cover the guidelines, the current ones for prescribing radiographs and radiation safety among children. I'll talk about the challenges in pediatric radiography and how we can navigate some of these challenges. And then I will conclude by making some remarks about how we interpret images in order to make the most of them. So where did, how did X-rays come about? Just to give a brief recap, X-rays were discovered way back in 1895 by a German physicist by the name Wilhelm. And this was an incidental discovery. He was not a medic and he was not performing a medical procedure. He was actually busy in his uh, cathode ray lab during his, doing, doing his physics uh, experiments. And incidentally, the lights having been switched off, he noticed that when he powered his cathode ray tube by switching on the, the power supply, there, was, um, so there were some particles at a table nearby in the same room that would fluoresce and produce a green light. He switched off the power supply and the fluorescence stopped. And when he switched it back on again, he noticed the substances were glowing yet again, producing a green fluorescent glow. And thereafter, he realized that there must have been something being emitted by the cathode ray tube that was able to make substances fluoresce and glow. And thereafter, he carried on with several other experiments and he discovered that there must have been a ray that was coming from the cathode ray tube powered at a particular kilo voltage that was able to produce current and produce uh, an array that was un unknown at that time. And that is when he the X-ray because he didn't have a name for it. And that is just a, a diagram of Wilhelm's uh, physics laboratory where he was performing his experiments when he made the discovery. And he went ahead to really uh, build up on his novel discovery and he performed the first medical radiological examination by performing a, a plain X-ray of his wife's left hand. So X-rays are very high energy electromagnetic, wave, electromagnetic waves, and they can break chemical bonds in materials that they penetrate. And it is this breaking chemical bonds that alters the structure and function of cells in living tissue. Uh, initially, the use of X-rays was without any restraint because they are adverse effects are really not known. There were injuries because of exposure to radiation, but these injuries of the time not even attributed to the x-rays because of the slow onset of symptoms. And there we see Sir Wilhelm busy explaining his novel discovery to his fellow physicists and it must have been a very proud moment for the entire profession. So uh, this brings me to discuss radio sensitivity. What is radio sensitivity? This is a measure of a tissue or organs response to irradiation. Radiosensitive cells have the following characteristics. They have a high uh, mito mitotic rate. They undergo many future mitoses and they are primitive at the time of differentiation. So many of these, uh, all these characteristics mean mimic the cells that are found in children, okay? Most, uh, the bodies of children have cells that are still primitive and if all things remain constant, children have a longer lifespan than adults. And that is why they are more sensitive to radiation. And it gets even worse when you're talking about the unborn child, the fetus, the embryo, whereby the radio sensitivity is far, far, far more, much higher. 
um, common terminologies when you're talking about radiation sensitivity that you will encounter are deterministic and stochastic effects. What, are the, what is the difference between these terminologies? So to stochastic effects are effects that we are exposed to during the, the routine, the normal uh, radiological examinations that are performed for diagnostic purposes. And these are the effects that we are actually worried about when we perform dental uh, radiological examinations. These effects are probability effects. They can occur at any dose. They don't have a threshold dose. They can occur at a very small dose as well. And the probability of stochastic effects happening increases as you increase the dose, the radiation dose. Stochastic effects include sublethal changes to the DNA of living cell. Uh, the, when these effects take place, they modify the DNA of cells. And that is when we get things, uh, uh, it results in carcinogenesis, for example and long-term heritable effects. So in the field of dental uh, radiology, we are concerned about stochastic effects. And which ones are deterministic? Deterministic effects are predictable effects. They occur at very large radiation doses. Uh, for example, the doses that are, are encountered in nuclear accidents or atomic explosions like the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki back in the, in the day, whereby they are key, uh, key, there is killing of a large number of cells. And because they are predictable, they have threshold doses. And this is, these are the kind of effects that patients in, uh, are, are exposed to when they undergo radiotherapy. For example, you can predict that at a certain number of grays, uh, uh, in terms of dosage, the patient will have mucositis or xerostomia or many other effects that can happen. But within the confines of dental uh, radiological examinations, deterministic of the effects do not occur because we are dealing with much uh, smaller doses of radiation. And just to put you into perspective concerning deterministic effects before I go on with stochastic effects. These are effects that occur once again because of large uh, doses of radiation. So this is a periapical radiograph of a, a nine-year-old uh, girl who underwent radiotherapy at the age of four because of Hodgkin's disease. And because uh, radiotherapy began after calcification, uh, radiotherapy was done after calcification had begun, you can see the detrimental effects to the dentition, whereby there was stunting of the development of the incisors with premature closure of the apices of the incisors. And uh, the panoramic radiograph of the same patient reveals the same thing, stunted roots and premature closure of the apices. So these are deterministic effects that can occur at very large radiation doses. Like I said, in dental imaging, we are concerned about stochastic effects. And most data currently on radiation-induced carcinogenesis is from populations that were exposed to very high levels of radiation. But in principle, because they are based on probability, even very, very low doses of radiation pose risk to stochastic effects. And this is called the linear theory, which is as a result of extrapolation from what is seen after exposure to very large doses. Among the kind of cancers that have been reported after exposure to ionizing radiation, uh, leukemias have been seen after bone marrow radiation, especially in children who are very young, under 20 years, and especially the first decade. There have also been reports of um, radiation-induced thyroid cancer, and this is greater early in childhood, and several cohorts of children have been studied in regard to this. Uh, there are also studies that have associated tumors of salivary glands and dental radiography. So having laid down that foundation and now we, uh, we understand the detrimental effects of radiation and the stochastic effects, that brings me to the guidelines for dental radiographs. There are guidelines that have been put in place to guide your practice as a, 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 a pediatric dentist. And these recommendations have been developed to assist in making uh, appropriate decisions for specific circumstances. They are not a rigid constraint on your clinical practice. 
but they otherwise ensure that the welfare of the patient and yourself is prioritized. Otherwise, they are superseded by your clinical judgment, but you can always make reference to them in cases where you're not sure. And there are many professional establishments that have uh, given recommendations that have been factored over time, guidelines that guide radiographic practice. There are very many international bodies. You can see this is just some of them. Uh, in, the, in America and Canada, the, uh, the guidelines that are in place right now governing radiography in children, adolescents, and patients with health, special health care needs originated from the Committee of Pediatric Radiology, and that was in where there's this document 2012. And across Europe, we have the guidelines of the European Commission, which uh, the latest revision was back in 2004. Uh, but currently, there has been a revision of the American and Canadian guidelines with the latest revision in 2017. And there are guidelines uh, from different countries, and they may vary slightly because countries are allowed to alter them a little bit to fit various setups. And because of this, a uh, radiological board, the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, and International Academy of Dental and Maxillofacial Radiology have given position statements to harmonize most of these guidelines and give us a framework from which we can operate. So what do these guidelines actually address? So these guidelines by the international bodies address all aspects of your radiological practice, whether you are the one uh, prescribing the radiograph or you're actually carrying it out because perhaps you have uh, an x-ray machine in your practice. These guidelines govern the selection criteria for patients with different uh, conditions, factors regarding equipment and receptors, how you view and report your images, how you reduce radiation exposure to the patients. There are also guidelines about how to train your staff to be qualified to handle uh, radiation and how you maintain quality assurance in your practice, especially in your own uh, a radiological uh, modality. Um, in terms of radiation safety within the pediatric practice, I once again want to mention that we are all uh, exposed to, to some degree of radiation, even if not for diagnostic purposes. There is natural radiation that comes from the environment, and we call it background radiation. This comprises cosmic radiation or radiation from uh, soil or the water that we ingest. But again, there is man-made radiation, which is uh, for various reasons. And today I'm concerned about the diagnostic aspect of man-made radiation. And uh, if you look at medical uh, radiation and dental radiation, it is reassuring to actually see that dental radiography comprises a very small proportion of what we are already uh, exposed to. And if you put it against medical imaging, then the kind of doses that we are dealing with in dental radiography are actually quite minimal. But that doesn't mean that we should take them for granted. And this diagram just gives an illustration of the effective doses from different radiological examinations. What I want to highlight here is simply that um, if you look at intraoral radiography, we are dealing with doses as low as five microsieverts for the bite wings. But when you look at the extraoral radiography, we're dealing with doses as low as nine microsieverts for panoramic machines. It can vary up to 26, depending on the machine that you're using. But when you move to cross-sectional imaging, the 3D imaging, then we're dealing with larger doses, although still the Conbeam CT, which is what we utilize mostly in our general practice, is still having quite a, a, a low dosage with uh, dosages as low as 20 microsieverts, depending on the machine that you're using, because this can vary. But if you put it again as something like medical CT, of the abdomen, we're talking of dosages in the range of 10,000 microsieverts. So if you're going to put 10,000 against dosages of five for your bite wings, then it's a little reassuring that we're using very small doses in uh, radiological uh, dental imaging. There are three principles of radiation protection that we must adhere to. The principle of justification requires that the benefit to the patient from the diagnostic exposure must exceed the low risk of harm. 
the principle of optimization states that for every uh, exposure, you must use every means to reduce unnecessary exposure to the patient by using the ALARA principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable. And the principle of dose limitation requires that no individual should be exposed to unacceptably high doses. So the facets of radiation protection are four. Clinical judgment, which is your responsibility as the clinician that is ordering or performing this technique. How you select your patient and protect them. The choice of modality that you use and the radiographic technique is important. And then again, how you interpret the final radiograph and good documentation. Um, clinical judgment is paramount to determine the need and type of radiograph for each and every patient. So this is on a case-to-case -case basis. And routine radiography based on a generalized approach is actually unethical. For example, you may not perform a biting for a patient simply because it's long since they had one, but you must justify it based on the particular patient's history and, uh, and environmental factors that they are exposed to. So I'll just go through different clinical scenarios and, and uh, outline some of the guidelines that are in place currently governing pediatric practice. And the first one is dental caries. So in the assessment of dental caries, the most important thing is to be able to group the patient according to their risk category into patients who are low risk and, and the patients who are moderate and those who are high risk. And what indicators do we use? We use the risk indicators like diet, um, oral hygiene, look at the factors, the, uh, the local factors in the patient's mouth, other environmental factors like uh, is the patient using fluoridated water, among others. And having this together with your clinical examination, you can tell whether the patient is high risk, moderate risk, or low risk. So we have the new patient, the recall patient who has evidence of clinical caries, and the recall patient who has no clinical caries and also not at obvious risk of caries. So for the new patient who is still with, uh, in uh, deciduous dentition stage, selected radiograph can be performed, but only if the proximal surfaces cannot be visualized up or probed. Otherwise, if there is no evidence of disease, then there is no indication for radiography. When they have transitional dentition, again, you can individualize your examination and special, uh, specific um, images of comprising bite wings and selected periapicals or a panoramic, if necessary, can be performed. And when they're in permanent dentition, like the patient who are in late teens, you can perform a bite wing and a panoramic or bite wing and selected periapicals. A full mouth intraoral exam is acceptable if there's clinical evidence of generalized oral disease. And how about the patient with clinical caries who is coming for a recall visit? It is acceptable to perform posterior bite wings at six to 12 month intervals, only if proximal surface cannot be examined. And in the recall patient with no clinical caries and who's not at risk, if they're in deciduous or transitional dentition, they can have bite wings at 12 to 24 months intervals if you can't uh, visualize the proximal surfaces. And in the permanent deficition stage, bite wings are acceptable at 18 to 36 months interval. And note that in permanent deficition stage, it is unlikely that you'll be able to, to visualize proximal surfaces clinically. So it's acceptable to perform these radiographs within 18 to 36 months. But what stands out in the guidelines for caries assessment is that only if proximal surfaces cannot be visualized or popped, then the patient can have a radiograph performed. How about in orthodontics? Mixed in, in mixed dentition stage, for example, at the point where you are expecting the canines to erupt from around 10 onwards, the patients may need radiographs, especially if there is delay in eruption or you suspect a displacement of uh, the canine to take a different path, you can perform radiographs to determine any need of interceptive treatment. The lateral CEF is a common radiograph uh, for orthodontic uh, evaluation, and it can be performed pre-treatment or at the end of functional appliance treatment because you want to assess the position of the incisors or even before the end of active 
fixed appliance treatment. For patients who got uh, facial asymmetry, okay, like in some hypoplastic conditions, a posterior anterior view of the face is acceptable to assess facial asymmetry. And there are times when um, the normal conventional imaging is inadequate to answer your diagnostic question, then it is indicated and justified to perform 3D imaging in the form of cone beam CT. But this may not be used for routine orthodontic assessment, but only for specific candidates. For example, in localization of impacted teeth, in this periapical, we see an impacted canine, uh, a maxillary canine, and it is not possible from this view to know uh, the exact size of the follicle or even the effect that the impacted canine is having on the surrounding teeth. And uh, to localize this tooth better and to assess the effect on the adjacent structures, you can perform a, a cone beam scan. And in this cross-sectional axial slice, you can see that the root is positioned palatal to the central and lateral incisor. The follicular space can be measured on a one-to-one -one basis, hence you get accurate measurements, and you can even be able to tell when cystic transformation is going on. And we can also be able to see the effect it's having on the roots of the other incisors. You can see signs of uh, external resorption. In the monitoring of growth, acceptable have a radiograph after eruption of the first tooth, depending on your clinical judgment, to assess uh, the patient's growth and development. But this should not be repeated unless they, it's dictated by clinical signs and symptoms. Per panoramic or periapicals performed for initial assessment of developing molars, again, should not be repeated routinely unless there is clinical indication for this. How about assessment of skeletal maturity? Conventionally, hand and wrist radiographs have been used for this, whereby the couples and metacouples are visualized for certain ossification centers. It is known that ossification happens in a predictable pattern, and this can be correlated to the patient's age. Unfortunately, uh, however, there are studies which have disputed the accuracy of hand and wrist radiographs in predicting growth spurts, like in puberty. And so currently in many places across the UK, they are not performing hand and wrist radiographs as standard of care for orthodontic, uh, pre-orthodontic uh, pre assessment. Radiographic assessment of cervical vertebrae can also be used to establish the stage of skeletal maturity using certain cephalometric landmarks of the cervical spine. In terms of receptors, the fastest receptors should be used. If you're using conventional film, you must use films in the, uh, in the E or F speed. And it is even advisable to use digital sensors because they offer dose savings of up to 75% and the diagnostic quality is comparable. So this is just an illustration of different sensors the first one is the conventional Kodak film in its envelope. The second one is a phosphor plate in the barrier uh, protection. And for the children, when you're using the conventional film, we're talking about size zero for the children. You can use size one if you need to image the periapical region. For the uh, very grown children, maybe in the late adolescence, sometimes you can use a size two film, but for the small children, use a size zero and they are able to tolerate that better. For the phosphor plates, we have different sizes from zero to four. And for pediatric imaging, you should use zero or one. And the third one, uh, the third and the fourth are the solid state detector. This is a CCD sensor. So for the children, we're talking about size zero or size one yet again. And for the CMOS sensor, which is the fourth one, we're talking about size one for children because they come in two sizes, size one for the children and size one for size two for the adults. See, film and sensor holders are advised in order to align the film with a collimated beam. And this uh, helps you to get better radiographs and reduces the number of free takes. It also helps you to eliminate exposing the patient's finger to ionizing radiation if they have to hold, to hold the film with the finger. Then collimation, what is collimation? This just means to limit 
the size of the beam that is exiting your aiming cylinder so that a very small uh, po uh, volume of the patient's tissues is exposed to radiation, as you can see here. And there are different types of collimators, the rectangular collimators and the round collimators. The, round, the rectangular collimators are more efficient in reducing the size of the beam and preventing scatter and in limiting the size of the beam to the receptor size. And so they give you dose savings up to five times compared to, to round collimators. And if you've purchased a, a radiological machine that came with an open aiming cylinder, there are modifications you can do to actually collimate the beam and reduce exposure to the patient. For example, you can have met, a, a rectangular metallic shield fitted to the open aiming device to collimate the beam. The other thing you can do is to, again, have a, a, an, an ext, um, a rectangular collimator placed at the open end of the tube. So, of the tube. so these are just different ways of collimating the beam. Again, in pediatric radiography, leaded aprons with a collar must be used, especially because of the thyroid gland, which is more susceptible to exposure during dental and uh, radiography due to anatomic position, particularly in the children. Unfortunately, there are instances where we are unable to use a leaded apron and collar. For example, for the panoramic encephalometric radiographs, your patient may ask you why the radiograph is being performed or was performed without a leaded apron. And you should be able to explain this to them because when they wear a, an apron high in the neck or when there is a thyroid collar, like you can see here, we get a, an artifact in the, in the central region and this hinders the diagnostic capability of the radiograph. So for this reason, we do not perform panoramic radiographs with leaded aprons and thyroid collar. Same as in the lateral cephalograms, I said they are used to assess cervical vertebrae. So we need to be able to see C1 to C7. For example, uh, this is a, a lateral ceph of an eight-year-old boy who had cleft lip and palate and stunted development of the cervical vertebra. And you see the difference in a normal eight-year-old child. If you compare the C1 to the C7, you can see the difference in the cervical vertebra. So for this reason, we do not uh, give the children leaded aprons and thyroid collars when we are performing uh, panoramic and cephalometric views. So that's for two-dimensional radiography. And there are those instances when your diagnostic question remains unanswered with your two-dimensional and conventional radiographs. And that forces you to image the patient in three dimension. And what is closest to us in dental imaging and with regards to the children will be Conbeam CT. This will be the, your next port of call as long as it's justified and the benefits of the procedure outweigh the risk. So how does 3D imaging differ from two-dimensional imaging? The limitations of two-dimensional imaging are well known, whereby we are collapsing a three-dimensional volume, three volume of the patient's tissues onto a two-dimensional receptor. And with that comes distortion and a lot of superimposition, as you are seeing here. But then a time comes when you really need clarity before making certain clinical judgments. And with three-dimensional imaging, you are able to image the patient in cross sections and you can pick out the section that you want to visualize. You can select the slice thickness and you eliminate all the superimposition of structures that you do not want to see. That is a benefit of Conbeam CT, but all the same, it must be justified. And the indication of Conbeam must weigh the outweigh the risk of exposing the patient. So if you're adapting Conbeam, there are a few things you need to know. The field of view chosen must be the appropriate field of view. The larger the field of view, the larger the exposure to your patient. We have different machines with different capabilities in, term, in terms of the field of view. There are some that can actually image the whole head together with the cervical spine and you have them uh, and the airway and you have the medium field of, film of view. Some of these machines can only take a selected portion of the patient like the jaws and then the small field of view where you can only image one side of the patient's jaw at a time. The machines have different selection, selective capabilities where um, the, the large field of view machine can actually be, 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 you can actually select the 
particular place, uh, area of the patient's tissues that you want to visualize. So you must always select the appropriate field of view and limit the patient's exposure to ionizing radiation. And with CONBIM CT now comes looking at three-dimensional images. You must be able to review the entire volume of data that is given to you. Do not only look at your special area of interest, but the whole volume of data that is given to you after this scan must be evaluated and reported, and you must look at it entirely in 360 degrees. The other beautiful application of this CONBIM CT is the ability to reconstruct and, and get a three-dimensional model of the patient's tissues, which you can visualize in different window settings. You can uh, select whether you want to see teeth only, whether you want to see teeth and bone, or whether you want to see a color rendered image, or whether you want to see both soft tissue and bone. Although we know the limitations of Convin City, that it is not uh, optimal in imaging soft tissue structures. But the beauty of the three-dimensional image is that it gives you a general overview of the patient's craniofacial uh, structures. It is not adequate to actually make a diagnosis because you're supposed to make your diagnosis using the cross sections. But this is very good for illustrating your treatment plan to the patient and what changes you intend to make and the patient can really appreciate what exactly you intend to do uh, during the treatment. And by adapting CONBIM CT, what must you do as a practitioner? Because it is not just about deciding, I am not able to, to make enough, um, I'm not able to draw a conclusion from two dimension and moving to 3D, but what measures must you take as a practitioner? You must be able to, to justify the additional radiation dose that you're exposing your patient to. If you haven't, uh, if you're not comfortable with doing cross sections like before, then you need to familiarize yourself with how to view these cross sections. You need to make the most uh, diagnostic yield out of the volume of data that is given to you. Uh, your CONBIM CT image, uh, sorry, the CONBIM CT image of the patient is going to include other structures, especially if it's a larger field of view. You're going to have the cervical spine, the airway, paranasal sinuses, and even cranial contents. And all this must be accounted for. You must be able to detect systemic findings that are otherwise haven't been seen before, even if they are outside your area of interest. And if this is too much for you, then you must reduce the risk of litigation and make more referrals as a practitioner. The current executive statement by the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiologists requires you to do the following, because since CBCT reveals so much more than two-dimensional imaging, all the data must be systematically reviewed and analyzed. And you may consult maxillofacial radiologists to assist in interpreting image for you if you are not willing to accept the responsibility to review the entire volume. I'd like to discuss a few challenges that I encountered in pediatric imaging and how we navigate them within the scope of the pediatric practice. The first problem is simply behavior management of the children. They are anxious, they are young, and of course they are going to be intimidated by the mere dental setup. How about when you actually want to introduce receptors or a film holder into their mouth for them to bite? They are likely to be apprehensive about this. So, of course, there are the normal things you usually do to go around this to try and calm the child down and to alleviate anxiety, to tell them a story about taking a picture of the tooth. Or you may try to simulate the procedure using somebody they trust, like their parent or an older Sometimes this may not work. You may be forced to defer the procedure until the next visit and maybe possibly make temporary interventions in the meantime. And if this does not work at all, then we may have to perform uh, radiological procedures that can be done under sedation, but that is really be a last port of call. There are issues to do with gagging, like patients who've got a very strong gag reflex. You can try ask the patient to breathe uh, faster and to breathe through the nose and usually the older children are able to cooperate 
The other thing you can do is to apply some topical anesthetic to the area where you intend to place the film or the sensor just to somehow reduce the sensitivity of that area. Some children just have small mouths, especially if they're very young and they may not even be able to open their mouth wide enough for you to place the sensor. So there are a few adjustments that you can do in the scope of your uh, practice. And for the very young children like the toddlers, they can be stabilized by an accompanying parent or guardian. You can hold the film for them. Uh, if you can be able to get leaded uh, gloves, there are places where leaded gloves are available to prevent unnecessary exposure to the fingers of the guardian or the parent. Again, we recommend using the smallest film or, or sensor available, and this is more comfortable to the child. There are times when you can try and place the film in the buccal sulcus rather than in the lingual sulcus because it is more it is easier for the child to tolerate this. Placing the sensor in the lingual on the lingual side for a very small child is very uncomfortable and you're unlikely to get their cooperation. But if you're going to place the film in the buccal sulcus, then you have to modify your examination because this means that the X-ray beam has to come from the opposite side of the mouth as, co as compared to what you're used to. And uh, this may not give you, uh, this may not give you uh, a perfect radiograph in terms of there will be superimposition of many structures along the path of the beam. But remember again that only the, the teeth that are, the, the structures that are closest to the sensor are the most um, detailed and the rest will be a bit obscured. So you'll be able to get some diagnostic information from that kind of a radiograph, albeit even though it is not uh, perfect. There is a modification you can perform for intraoral radiography, uh, the periapicals, whereby you can adjust the placements of the film or the sensor. Um, the most ideal radio radiographic technique is the paralleling technique, whereby uh, it gives you more accurate uh, radiographs in terms of dimensions of structures, and also um, it is reproducible and very good for following up patients, for example, those who have had trauma. But many children uh, will not accept the paralleling technique because you have to separate the receptor and the teeth to be able to align them parallel. And this can be very uncomfortable because like for the maxilla, the film is almost going to be mid palate and this is very uncomfortable. Most children will not accept this. So one of the things you can do for periapical radiography is a modified bisecting the angle technique whereby you're going to place the film flat on the occlusal plane as if you want to perform an occlusal radiograph. And um, uh, the bisector, which is a line, this is a bisector. The bisector is a line that divides the angle formed by the long axis of the tooth and the long axis of the film. And now you're going to position the X-ray beam to cut the bisector at right angles. And you're going to get uh, an accurate image which is reproducible. The, uh, the benefit of this is that the film is not touching the patient's mucosa and most children are able to cooperate. As the clinician performing this technique, you'll have to alter the angulation of the beam. Remember for the, the normal periapical uh, bisecting angle, we're talking of about 50 uh, degrees downwards. But because the film and or the receptor has been placed occlusal, you have to modify this angle to be wider, say around 70 to 80, so that it can meet, meet the bisector at right angles. And this is your resultant radiograph. The other modification that you can do is regarding bite wings. Uh, I've spoken about intraoral radiography, but how do you modify your bite wing technique? Uh, we, we, there is currently uh, machi panoramic machines that come with an inbuilt program to perform extraoral bite wings. And ex extraoral bite wings could work for a child who is not going to allow you to place a sensor within the mouth. The child is just positioned in the panorex machine in the usual way, like you can see, with head stabilizing and chin stabilizing apparatus. And we select the bite wing uh, program which comes with some machines. There are different brands of Panorex machines that currently have an extra oral bite wing capability. Just to mention, a few, for example, the Sirona, there is a Care Stream, and um, 
vertex, among others, quite a number. And this is a kind of a field limitation technique where the patient will only be exposed on the sides and there will be no radiation beam as a tube uh, oscillates around the patient in the, in the, in the front, at the front. So uh, with the extraoral bite wing modification, the patient can have good bite wings which occupy a wider anatomical region if the sensor is outside the patient's mouth. And this is just an article uh, that was published trying to compare the, uh, the diagnostic accuracy between intraoral uh, bite wings and extraoral bite wing radiography, because I know you're probably asking, will I be able to visualize series on a panoramic view? This is not the normal uh, panoramic view. Some exposure settings have been adjusted when you select the bite wing program. And when you take it to pediatric mode, it even comes with greater dose savings. So here, this was an ex vivo study where they used radiological phantom to assess the accuracy to detect, for detecting enamel caries. And this is just how they position the radiological phantom for the extraoral bite wing uh, acquisition. You can see the head stabilizing apparatus there and the chin rest and the patient biting there, sorry, the phantom there placed on the bite block. And then this is how they position the phantom again to capture the intraoral bite wing technique whereby they use the PSP sensor and the CMOS sensor just to see which one was more accurate in detecting enamel caries. And within the confines of this uh, ex vivo study, they reported that there was really no sign uh, significant difference in the accuracy of detecting enamel caries between the PSP sensor, which is this one, this image here was for by the PSP sensor, and this was by the CMOS sensor, and this was the image that was got, what they got from the extraoral bite wing using the Panorex machine. And they were able to detect enamel caries to acceptable accuracy level for all the three. And the, the differences were not uh, statistically significant. The other beauty of the extraoral bite wing uh, is that you are able to visualize much, much more. You can see here that you're able to visualize the crowns of the teeth, the entire roots, the periapical tissues, the intercrestal bone levels, and even the developing wisdom tooth can be visualized, including the surrounding bone. So you can also be able to diagnose other pathologies pertaining to the periapical region or, or periodontal teeth, so to speak. And um, we've discussed the guidelines, how you justify your radiography, and now you've performed your uh, imaging procedure, whether it's a conventional or whether it's a cross-sectional imaging. So what do you do with that image? Then you must interpret it in the best way possible so that you can get the best diagnostic yield, because that is what the principle of optimization requires you to do. So how do you interpret your image? So in interpreting your radiological image, you must follow a systematic uh, approach and you must visualize all the image data that is available to you in its entirety and do not just focus on your area of interest. Again, you must keep appraising yourself with your knowledge of radiology, refresh your radiological anatomy and your knowledge of pathology. And this brings me to discuss radiological manifestations of serious disease. Well, why, why do I say serious disease? I mean, all diseases are serious, whether it's benign uh, or it's malignant, it is serious disease. But this is just an, an analogy I'm using to refer to those conditions that if not picked up early, are likely to have a very fatal and can be life-threatening. Most of these conditions have subtle changes that manifests radiologically. And if you don't train your mind to actually recognize some of these changes, then you can mi miss out things that if you saw them, you could, you could actually have made a big difference in the life of your patient. Some of the manifestations of life-threatening or serious illnesses, ill-defined borders, whereas benign lesions tend to be well-defined for the most time, always, but they tend to be well-defined. Most uh, aggressive illnesses will be infiltrative in nature and they'll be poorly 
mind, okay? When a patient comes and you expose uh, them to a radiograph, there are floating teeth. Floating teeth, I mean teeth that have no support. The destruction of the periodontal tissue and the surrounding alveolar bone. These are things to be taken seriously and must be correlated to the clinical features. When there's evidence of an ulcerative lesion, clinically, plus underlying bone disease, then this is something that is likely to be aggressive. When there is loss of lamina dura, we need to look into this more attentively. When there's destruction of cortical outlines, for example, you look at your panoramic radiograph and there is destruction of the cortical, the dense cortical outlines of the orbit or the maxillary sinus or the follicles of developing dentition or maybe the, the cortices of the inferior dental canal are not visible. This is something that you need to pay very close attention to. Feature uh, evidence of rarefaction of bone. By this, I mean that osteopenic appearance, so that you can see the bone is, is losing its, over, uh, its normal expected density and is beginning to, beginning to look sort of osteoporotic. You need to pay a close attention to this. And this uh, brings me, as I wind up, to talk about leukemia. Why leukemia? Because this is a malignant tumor, which is most very common in childhood. Well, it's not very common, but it's the most common malignancy in childhood, accounting for about 33% of childhood malignancies. And leukemia can manifest radiologically in a very subtle way. And if you're able to correlate these subtle changes on radiographs, with clinical presentation of patients, then you're able to pick out that there is something serious that is happening. Acute leukemia is most common in the first decade uh, as compared to the chronic leukemias, and it can have gradual onset uh, within a few weeks, posit by, followed by a rapid progression of the disease within the next few weeks to several months. The clinical features in leukemia include fatigue, patient is complaining of just generalized tiredness, tiredness. They have features of bone marrow suppression like pallor, spontaneous hemorrhage, and the patient has enlarged gingiva. Like you can see um, in this picture here, the patient has got bleed, uh, bleeding and the gums look very inflamed. And in the presence of local factors, you can easily just handle this as some, some form of periodontitis, but that is why your imaging findings come in handy. Uh, generalized patient, generally, patient can have lymph nodes, uh, like some mandibular lymphadenopathy. They may report paresthesia if there's neurological involvement or enlargement of the, of the liver and spleen. And most of these signs and symptoms in leukemia can be very nonspecific and can, can easily mimic common viral illnesses if you, if you are not very attentive to the detail. So uh, radiology is not very central in the initial diagnosis of leukemia because um, the diagnosis and staging of leukemia really depends on hemato hematological tests, including cytogenetics and immunohistochemistry. But then again, imaging findings adjunct to the diagnosis or maybe the first indication of relapse for a patient progressing well to therapy and then comes with the following changes in their radiograph. Disappearance of the lamina dura and the cortical outlines of the follicles of developing teeth. They may present with loss of alveolar crystal bone and floating or mobile teeth mimicking periodontitis. Cancellous bone destruction, as I've mentioned, with ill-defined radiolucences that seem to be uh, generalized or may really be localized to one part of the jaw, it really depends on their stage of presentation. Increase in the PDL space is commonly seen when there is leukemic infiltration, or you may see occlusal displacement, especially of the teeth that are developing or erupting, where the follicles are actually extruded. You can see a loss of inferior dental canals bilaterally because the cortical outlines are generally going to fade away. And this is a case that was reported of a six-year-old uh, girl who presented with oral ulcerations, spontaneous hemorrhage, and she also had a fever. And uh, she had complained of bleeding from the mouth, and she had some mobile teeth of six weeks duration. 
And with a pub exposed a panoramic image. This is a cropped pantomograph of what was seen at the, uh, at the visit. And there was a developing second molar there whose cortical outline had completely been lost. Uh, there were very subtle signs of rarefaction of bone when you look at the area uh, interradicular region of the second deciduous molar there is some rarefaction of bone which is quite subtle at this point a radiograph that was exposed another six weeks later uh, depicts further um, displacement of the developing second molar and uh, even larger a refraction around this developing tooth, as you can see in the magnified image down there, and loss of the, the, the alveolar bone that is supporting the deciduous molar, and this can result in mobility of the dentition. And this is just a periapical radiograph of a different patient with acute leukemia. Uh, the first presentation of the patient, you can see the loss of the lamina. The, the, there is a bit of lamina dura, but it is lost in some aspects there with some periapical radiolucency. Some roots have complete loss of lamina dura there. And you can see generalized refraction of this bone with very patchy radiolucencies that occur in an uncontrolled fashion. Another radiograph of the same patient uh, exposed a few weeks later, and you can see enlargement of the PDL space of that molar, and now there is complete loss of the lamina dura, such that even what was present before has been completely lost. These are just periapical radiographs, again, uh, in illustrating loss of lamina dura in acute leukemia. And this is an old panoramic radiograph of a patient who had acute leukemia and note the resorption of bone surrounding, uh, uh, the resorption of alveolar bones around the roots of the first molars, almost giving an impression of juvenile uh, periodontitis. And of course, if the, such a patient has um, local factors, you can easily attribute this to ongoing periodontal disease. But if you could correlate this with the clinical presentation in its entirety, then it could actually bring something to light that there is a systemic problem that is bigger than periodontitis. So I've spoken about many things, but what do I want to leave you with tonight in form of summary? The components of good radiographic practice include being able to select your patients appropriately and justify this with good clinical examination. You must optimize radiation protection and have a holistic and systematic approach in how you interpret your radiographs. Intraoral, radio, uh, intraoral imaging remains the primary diagnostic modality in dental imaging. And three-dimensional imaging is only justified when conventional radiography is inadequate and the potential benefits of exposing the patient to additional radiation outweigh the risk of harm. Conbeam CT data, if you adopt Conbeam CT, must be supplemented with a written report. And this includes a complete full interpretation of the imaging findings. And when all is said and done, you the clinician are the decision maker. Protect the pediatric patient by minimizing the radio radiation burden. And how do you do this? By keeping all exposures as low as reasonably achievable. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Obukondo. Wow, wow, that was an excellent presentation, and I have learned quite. Uh, I have learned quite a lot uh, from it. So we'll now go into the into the into the into the questions, and uh, I will ask Dr. Masharia to take us through the Q and A section. Dr. Masharia, please. Yeah, hi Kere. Good evening everyone. Hey Dr. Pondo. Um, Hello. Thank you for, <laughs> yeah, thank you for a very enlightening presentation. That was uh, very enlightening. And we acknowledge this is an important topic as you have highlighted as children are more radiosensitive to adults than adults. So we'd really like to thank you for this. 
and we'd like you to come back. So um, going right into the Q&A, I only have one question. Um, I'm encouraging anyone else who has a question to please put it in. Um, the first question is from Dr. Wambugu Mumenya, and uh, he's thanking you for a great presentation, and he has two questions. The first question, uh, is what is the maximum dose a practitioner can be exposed to via digital sensor on the hand as, op as opposed to scatter before one exhibits carcinogenic effects over a long time? That is 23 for 60 USB. I think those are many questions in one. Um, okay, you can try and answer that one first, Dr. Pondo. Um, um, I'm not sure I understand your question very well, but I'll, I'll try and answer it. You're asking about the maximum dose that a practitioner yes. can be exposed to. Well, I will, I'm not going to answer that with a figure, but uh, there is radiation monitoring by the Radiation Protection Board for those who own radiation uh, equipment. If you own a radiological equipment of any kind, it must be registered by the Radiation Protection Board, whereby they come and inspect your facilities and they, they, uh, they are going to allow you to practice if you meet a, a, some certain bare minimum requirements. So there are uh, guidelines in place internationally to ensure that even practitioners or people who are exposed to radiation while at work, occupational exposure, so to speak, uh, that people are protected and there are set limits for radiation exposure. And for the dental practice, um, currently the, the set limit is 20 millisieverts. You're not to be exposed to anything beyond 20 millisieverts and that protects you from any uh, deterministic effects of ionizing radiation. I'd like to encourage you further that the kind of dosages that you are exposed to for dental radiography are very, very low. And if you are able to actually monitor radiation by using radiation dosimeters, I do have one. If you have a machine and you're the one performing, you should invest in radiological dosimeters like um, in, sorry, uh, radiation monitoring devices like the TLD device, which you can submit to the radiation board for analysis monthly. And they can be able to tell you how much radiation you are possibly exposed to. But then again, your radiological technique is of paramount importance, even in governing the amount of radiation you're exposed to. If you're going to follow all the guidelines, that's why I talked about radiographic practice being a uh, being, being monitored by guidelines, because if you're going to perform your radiographic technique in the correct way, what can you do? For example, you have to, to, position, to, to practice the position and distance rule. If you're in the room where the patient is, then you're going to have to stand at least six feet away from the X-ray machine and out of the path of the beam. And if you can do this, uh, studies have shown that the, uh, the radiation that you're exposed to from the intraoral machine will be almost negligible. The other thing you can do is barrier protection. You don't have to be in the same room with the patient. You can exit the room when you're performing the exposure. And when there is barrier protection, it is enough to actually attenuate the radiation beam to negligible or levels which cannot even be measured. And so if you combine good radiological practice, barrier shielding, stand out of the path of the X-ray beam, monitor your radiation exposure using the dosimeters, by wearing a dosimeter and submitting it for analysis, um, then you can be able to monitor how much radiation you're exposed to in general. And without giving a figure, I'd like to remind you that the stochastic effects are probability effects. They do not occur at a specific dose, but then again, the probability increases with the increase in the dosages. But be reassured that if you practice all these guidelines, then the amount of radiation that you, you would otherwise be exposed to would be so negligible for dental radiography. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pondo. That's a very exhaustive answer. Um, he has a second question as well. And um, he'd like you to kindly explain micro CT scanners at 40 micrometer or 30 micrometer, especially in pediatric molars. 
sorry, just come again. Michael City Scanners at. Uh, would you kindly explain mm -hmm. micro city scanners at 40 micrometers or 33 micrometers, especially in pediatric molars? Well, micro city scanners are currently not so widely available. And um, at the particular uh, at the particular dosages that you talk about, I'm not very familiar with how they would affect the pediatric patient. I would have to actually research on that and perhaps get back to you if I could share my email after this. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the next question from uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Salma. How do we take radiographs in a very young and cooperative patient? <laughs> In a very young and cooperative and cooperative patient, patient. Yes, and cooperative patient. Um, I I also went through that, but um, I don't know how to answer without repeating everything. But I'll I'll probably say to you that behavior management is key, and you must try and calm the patient down and alleviate their anxiety as much as possible. And how you approach the patient is very important. Simulate the procedure to an old, uh, to an adult that they trust, or even a sibling, and um, use the appropriate receptors for pediatric imaging. If they are totally unable to uh, accept this procedure, if it's something that can wait, make a temporary intervention, and then uh, postpone the, the examination to next time if it's something that can wait. If it cannot wait, then maybe that such a patient may have to be sedated, but that would really be the last port of call. Thank you. Thank you. And then she also has a second question. So she would uh, like to ask, how do you convince parents of apprehensive parents? How do you convince parents of apprehensive children who think um, x-rays are ha hazardous to their child's health? Well, the beauty of today's world is that there is a lot of data out there. It's not like a long time ago where your word was final. And if you're equipped as a, as a practitioner then you should be able to explain to the patient the known hazards of ionizing radiation, which I've covered uh, in my presentation today, but also reassure them that the kind of dosages that we are utilizing in, uh, in dental imaging are very, very low and unlikely to expose the patient to any harm. Again, let them know that the benefit, the overall benefit of this procedure that you want to perform far outweighs the low risk of harm to the patient. You can also equip them with some articles that they can read to actually confirm this. And then as the practitioner also, perform your technique correctly so that you don't have to take to have any retakes done. Limit the radiation to the patient and be able to explain to them the steps that you are taking to limit the radiation dose. Use a thyroid collar with a leaded apron as much as possible, except for panoramic radiography and cephalometry. Thank you, Dr. Pondo. Um, I'll ask a question that Kevin is, uh, Dr. Kevin Nendo is asking, building on to Dr. Salma, and he uh, would like to know if there's any specific behavior management tips to help in uh, getting children to cooperate when taking radiographs. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, I would not say there is a specific behavior management tips, but I've given a number of, a number of uh, alternatives that you could try to, to choose because not everything will work for all patients. You know, speaking to one child may not work to the other child, okay? We, we, we would not work for another child probably because the children are different. They're coming to us as individuals. So you have to tailor this depending on the specific needs of your patient. If you cannot get the child to cooperate, try and have extra oral techniques that do not involve putting the sensor in the mouth or try the modifications that I talked about, like the modified uh, periapical or the modified bite wing where the, the sensor is on the buccal aspect in, instead of the, the lingual aspect. But yet again, if you completely cannot win the child's cooperation, 
if it's a very young child, you can restrain the child because that is acceptable as long as the parent consents to this. If not, you can always defer the examination and make temporary intervention. If it is something that cannot wait, for example, if you're talking about those radiological signs of serious illness and you really would want to refer such a patient because if a serious uh, underlying systemic condition must be ruled out, then they have to be sedated because we cannot do without performing the examination. Thank you. Um, there's anonymous attendee who would like to mm -hmm. know if we have a center doing the extra oral by twins locally that you spoke about. Um, thank you, anonymous attendee. At the moment, I am not sure because um, I've been in the country, I've been back only for a short duration, and I would have to do my groundwork to get to know what kind of machines people own currently and whether they have the Bitewing application program. But what I'd like to tell you that there is a number of machines that have this uh, capability and chances are that there is one at least that can be able to perform this technique. But this is something that I definitely need to look into but because it is available and not just with one machine, very, diff very many brands of machine have an inbuilt Bitewing technology, uh, Bitewing application. Thank you. I think we'll take you up on that later. Mm -hmm. um, is a doctor, um, in Dr. Diana Rob. she says, thank you for a great presentation. And she's, uh, she would like to know if the upper standard of plural of views can replace uh, IOPAs in an uncooperative child? Um, yes, Diana, in uh, Dr. Rop, in a, a cooperative child, we must substitute. And that is why I can, I'm even offering modifications of techniques. We know what is ideal is the paralleling technique because even the periapicals, the bisecting angle technique is inferior to the paralleling technique. But then again, many children will not even ask, uh, allow allow you to perform a paralleling technique radiograph on them and thereafter you can settle for the bisecting the angle technique if this is not possible yes the standard occlusal can definitely come in handy because you're able to visualize many things that you can see on the periapical uh, radiograph the spatial resolution might just be slightly less but they should be able to 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 they should be an, an appropriate alternative for a patient who cannot tolerate periapical radiographs, definitely. Right. <clears throat> and Dr. Faith Kilonzo is uh, also um, saying thank you for an excellent presentation. And her question is, if it is advisable to still dress a patient and um, herself as the dentist with a lead apron and collar, while using di di digital imaging and specifically IOPAs. Thank you, Dr. Kilonzo. Um, the current guidelines actually state that a leaded apron is not mandatory if you're going to adhere to all the principles of radiation protection, including how you perform your, your radiographic technique. Because uh, these are things that we have to constantly appraise ourselves with so that our technique does not deteriorate over time. If you position your patient correctly, if your uh, machine has a rectangular collimator, if you're out of the path of the incident X-ray beam, then there's no, absolutely no reason why you should also be leaded up. But because we don't always meet these ideal considerations, many times, Times there is a compromise in one or two. So there is no harm in wearing a leaded apron if you want to as a practitioner, if you're in the room. But if you're going to be outside the room, it is absolutely not necessary. If you're in the room, if you're six feet away and out of the path of the X-ray beam, it is not really necessary. But sometimes for your own uh, psychological uh, comfort, you can put on a leaded apron. But for the child, it is mandatory you must give the child a leaded apron and a thyroid collar because that is what the guidelines say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Grace Katukwe is also uh, appreciating the presentation and she'd like to know what uh, is a recommended, recommended infection control protocol for lead aprons. 
for lead aprons, okay. Yes. So the lead aprons must be disinfected by alcohol wipes or you, you have to use whatever you're using to disinfect surfaces in the room is acceptable. They don't have to be washed. They should not uh, be subjected to unnecessary bending because this produce uh, creates micro, um, it, it creates micropores in them and radiation uh, photons can go through. So you don't want to subject your leaded aprons to unnecessary bending. For example, you cannot wash it or put it into a washing machine, so to speak. But you should be able to swab it with alcohol-based uh, uh, swabs or whatever else you're using to sterilize your working surfaces in between patients. Thank you. So I am sorry, I had an issue on this end, but I'm back. The next question is uh, from Dr. Stella Kubasu, and she's saying thank mm -hmm. you for a very great uh, presentation. And um, I will read through what she's written, that clinically most children below age six present with um, multiple carious lesions. And the most uh, common one of x-ray routinely taken is the OPG. And uh, usually this shows carious extent and the position of the erupting sec um, secondary dentition. Because, and she's saying taking IOPAs is very frustrating in children. So, and that in fact, most pediatric dentists always ask for OPG, for OPGs. So she's basically asking what your take is on this. I think basically, um, if OPGs can uh, take the, uh, the place for uh, bilateral bitings and uh, perhaps the IOPAs, I want to conclude that question with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kubasu. And um, if you remember the beam geometry principles in how we acquire OPGs, the resultant radiographs will have less partial resolution if compared to the, their intraoral counterparts. What is really spatial radio resolution? Uh, that is really the ability to distinguish between two objects that are close to, together of different densities. And this capability is much less with the panoramic radiographs. And so with panoramic radiographs, yes, you can see um, a demineralization process going on on a tooth. It's not that you're not going to see it, you can see it. But the accuracy with which you can detect the extent is much, much less compared to the intraoral counterparts. So if it's really uh, within your control, it is preferable, preferable to perform bitewing radiographs or periapical radiographs because they accord you the best spatial resolution for caries detection. For the child who absolutely cannot allow you to perform periapical radiographs, because I understand what you talk about, that is why I mentioned them as challenges and even offered some suggestions as to how we can navigate some of these challenges. But if that absolutely does not work, if this is a child who is actually willing to sit still for a, quite a number of seconds for a panoramic radiograph, then it is better than nothing because the diagnostic yield you will get will still give you an indicator of how you're going to proceed with your treatment. Uh, uh, although it may not be 100% accurate, but it will be better than nothing. And uh, the other thing with the uh, caries detection under six, most of them still have a uh, very spaced out tip because they have the deciduous dentition. Um, make the most out of your clinical examination and probing. And then uh, um, just use your radiographs as an adjunct, because the guidelines say that as long as you can examine clinically and probe, radiographs may not always be indicated. But of course, if the panoramic radiograph is the only one that you can manage to perform, 
then go ahead and perform it because you are going to justify it clinically and you're going to get the consent of the parents and you can put this in your clinical rec records. And if it is available to you, go for the extra oral bite wing uh, capability. Thank you. Um, Dr. Teresa would like to know how effective is the back scatter shield and would you advise their use in digital handheld x-rays? Um, the, what did you say, the, meta, the scatter shield? Please come um, again. The back, back scatter shield. Mm -hmm. How effective it is mm. and would you advise its use in digital handheld x-rays? Okay, so those are two questions in one. The scatter shield is effective because it's going to block out uh, radiation scatter, first of all, from reaching the patient because the incident beam has stray photons and it's going to block out these stray photons that eventually, if you remember the interaction of X-rays with matter, they're going to bombard each other and they're going to change direction and they're going to go to all manner of places, including the patient's tissues to places where you did not intend to to expose in the first place. So it is very effective. I would have to look at studies to, to tell you how effective in terms of maybe percentages, but it is proven that it is effective and it is do, it reduces the, the patient's radiation dose by up to fivefold. When it comes to handheld dental x-ray machines, that is a totally uh, big topic on its own because um, I know they're being used in private practice, people have bought them, but I'd like to bust your bubble a little bit tonight, uh, but I'll be careful not to bust it completely because the radiological guidelines actually, um, actually recommend that handheld X-ray use be limited to various uh, circumstances, including forensic studies, community health programs in the outdoor areas, and research studies, for example, because the radiation from some of these machines, they function at very high radiation doses because they, they are powered by battery sources and they power at high kilo voltages, some of them, and many of them actually produce much more scattered radiation compared to the, the mounted counterparts. There have been improvement in some of them over the years, but because uh, control of these handheld uh, radiation devices is very difficult. You can, it is similar to a child having a gun because you can say, I'm going to teach my child not to shoot at any time. But what do you do? How do you control hand, the movement of handheld radiation devices? We know the detrimental effects of radiation because somebody will have it in this office today and carry it home tomorrow and tomorrow they'll move it to another office, use it and forget it somewhere else on the table. And because of this, the regulations are such that the day-to-day -day use of handheld devices is actually not encouraged. And these devices are ideally supposed to be limited to those setups whereby it is an emergency and you are not able to transport the patient to go and have a, a radiograph performed within the correct setting of barrier shielding and concrete walls and leaded walls. So in that case, their use should be limited to forensics and outdoors like research. So I don't encourage their use for day-to-day -day practice, although I know people are doing them, but studies are still going on. Machines are being improved day after day so you never know. But um, in terms of uh, metallic shielding, yes, it is effective. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Dr. Dimba, and she says she has not observed common usage of uh, the colored lead aprons locally. And um, how can the dental fraternity influence policy to this effect? Um, what I can say to that, thank you, Dr. Dimba, for your very important observation. And ours is to create awareness because radiological examinations are performed on a day-to-day -day basis in our practice. It's something we cannot do without, but we rarely talk about radiation use. And that informs this talk today because I would like to keep appraising us with what we are supposed to do in terms of our optimal uh, radio and correct 
radiographic practice. So leaded aprons are supposed to be used especially for children. The guidelines actually do not say that you must use a leaded apron for adults because if you're going to adhere by all the principles of uh, your technique and use a paralleling beam in the correct manner, except for the for the uh, vertex occlusal technique, whereby you can have the radiation beam in the lines of the uh, in the same uh, line as the reproductive organs. For the rest of all the dental radiographic procedures, if you're going to adhere by the guidelines and take them appropriately, for the adults, a leaded apron apron is actually not mandatory. Okay, but when it comes to the children, they are more susceptible up to ten times to the detrimental effects of ionizing radiation. And to think of the thyroid, the, the, the thyroid gland of a child, very much more radio sensitive and situated high up. So these children must be leaded and they must have a thyroid collar, except for panoramic and cephalometric uh, radi uh, examinations. So currently, allow me to preempt that there is a team that is busy with uh, formulating guidelines for radiological practice in the dental setup unique to our Kenyan, um, in, into, uh, unique for our local setup, which once, uh, once we are done, then those guidelines will be out there for everybody to observe and adherence shall be. And we are, we are hoping that there will be adherence to these guidelines. Thank you. The next question, you've actually already touched briefly into it, but um, the anonymous attendee would like to know your opinion on the amount of exposure to the clinician when using the portable x-ray machine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Macharia. I think I've already gone through that. So maybe we can move to the next question if you allow me to. Yes, please. So uh, Dr. Salma is back and she would like to know how we can prevent uh, gagging in young children while taking x-rays. Uh, preventing gagging in children and taking x-rays, uh, modify your technique because a hypersensitive gag reflux is very difficult to handle and it's not something you can talk the child out of. They are sensitive and there is not much you can do about that. Maybe for an older child, can you try ask the child to breathe in and out through the nose rapidly and this somehow takes away their attention from the procedure so that they become less sensitive. If it's not working, apply some topical anesthetic to the mucosa adjacent to the place where you want to place your receptor just to to numb that area a little bit and desensitize it if it's not working move your receptor to the back or vestibule perform your uh, bite wing procedure by putting the bite wing uh, a, a film on the back or vestibule as opposed to the lingual sulcus and that means uh, the uh, X-ray beam has to approach from the opposite side. Of course, compromising vis uh, visualization of some structures a little bit because of superimposition, but you'll be able to get a reasonable degree of information even from this radiograph. Thank you. And of course, the extraoral bite wings whenever they are available to us. Thank you. Um, next question is how do we deal with positioning issue when X-raying large tumors with panoramic X-ray machines? Um, thank you very much for that. How you perform a panoramic technique is already premeditated, okay? Because the patient is positioned within the panorex machine in a particular position that cannot be altered. You're going to stabilize the head and the chin using a head stabilizing apparatus, and you really cannot alter that. You can only switch between the different um, options for maybe a very, uh, 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 depending on the body size of the patient or whether it's a small body patient, you can choose those kind of options. But in terms of how you position your patient uh, with regard to the detector and the the X-ray beam, you cannot change that. So if there is a wide, a very large tumor that goes far beyond the extent of the radiograph, unfortunately, there is not much you can do about that. But perhaps you may perform your radiograph still just to see whatever the extent is within the uh, the jaws and the mid-facial tissues that the, the radiograph can capture. 
but for everything else that goes beyond the inferior border of the mandible and goes further uh, than the x-ray can accommodate, then you have to consider a different imaging technique. And in this case, you may now go for other extraoral uh, imaging modalities, if at all you need that, or this patient is actually just suited for three-dimensional imaging in the, in the form of uh, a large field of view, CBCT scan or computer tomography altogether, or any other advanced imaging modalities that can, entire the, that can capture the entire volume. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. And I would like to you know if you can take an OPG on a pregnant patient without the lead protective gear, uh, since the gown interferes with the X-ray image. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, for every radiological uh, examination, the net benefit to the patient must outweigh and supersede the low risk of harm. And um, the biggest problem we have with uh, leaded aprons with OPGs is the fact that they're going to cast a large artifactual shadow on the mandible. And um, if you have to take radiographs for panoramic, uh, sorry, for pregnant patients, it is advisable, first of all, to see by your clinical judgment whether the reason why you're performing the X-ray can wait because uh, the guidelines state that radiographic procedures that can be delayed should be delayed until after delivery, just also for the psychological uh, benefit to the patient. If it is not something that can wait, can you perhaps perform an intraoral um, radiograph to start with? If you really must perform a, a panoramic radiograph, you will have to take it without the apron. And uh, I also want to bring to your attention, although this is really uh, beyond the scope of this presentation today, that um, the radiation dose from the panoramic machine is still relatively low. It's actually comparable to most uh, dental radiographic examinations. And um, if the patient is beyond the period of organogenesis, then I believe if the benefit of the examination outweighs the risk of harm, you can go ahead and perform the examination if it is something that cannot wait, uh, because uh, the fetus, uh, the developing fetus is most susceptible to ionizing the damaging effects between uh, up to 12 weeks, sometimes up to 15 weeks, because this is a time of organogenesis. After that, as long as uh, the, the X-ray beam is not in line with the fetus, if it is justified and the benefit outweighs the low risk of harm, then it is justified to go ahead and perform the examination. All right, thank you, Dr. Dr. Opondo. Uh, Dr. Salma would like to know if it is safe to carry out multiple dental radiography in leukemic children who are undergoing chemotherapy. In, sorry, come again? Is it safe to carry out multiple dental radiography in leukemic children undergoing chemotherapy? Yes, it is. Uh, as long as you can justify the reason why you need the radiograph, I hope you are not performing it for research purposes just to see the radiological changes in leukemia. If that is, not the, if that is the only reason you're performing it, then it's not justified. But if it is justified by your clinical judgment that the patient needs radiography, yes, you can go ahead and take a radiograph. If anything, the patient is already exposed to so much in radiotherapy where now the dosage is in grays. Um, in dental radiography, we are still dealing with micro sieverts and there's really no comparison if you put it against what they are already receiving in terms of radiotherapy. So if the radiation uh, exposure for the bitewing or for the intraoral radiography is justified, you, are, you can go ahead and perform it. Thank you. Um, the next question we're about to wind up uh, is from anonymous and attendee. And I would like to know how accurate an orthopantomogram is in age assessment in teenagers around 16, 17, 18 years. Um, age assessment uh, must be done using a, a multiplicity of factors, not just a, 
radiographs alone. You have to be able to correlate imaging findings and specific uh, tools that you're going to use for age assessment. Which assessment technique are you using? For example, are you using Damigian or which one are you using? Because each one of them has uh, principles that you must follow. And if you're using uh, panoramic radiographs, yes, they are, they are accurate within certain confines. Uh, because um, as long as it is performed direct, uh, appropriately, um, you can be able to predict, depending on set standards, for how you expect the chronological age of a patient to match the dental age. So yes, you can use a, pan, uh, a, pantom a pantomogram uh, in correlation with other age assessment techniques that you are using. Remember, I talked about the hand and wrist radiographs, the lateral self look at the cervical vertebra, but there are age assessment methods that actually just rely on pantomographs. And yes, if performed uh, properly, it is adequate. Thank you. Uh, Dr. James Mwangi would like uh, to find out your take on um, uh, the fact that some insurances insist on x-ray images evidence before approval of uh, procedures and uh, he would like to know how we should go about this. Um, thank you, Dr. Mwangi. Uh, this is uh, sort of a pit because I'm going to answer it, uh, I'll be biased because I'm going to answer it as a, radio as a radiologist and not as a, uh, a pediatric dentist. So I'm going to be biased and say stick to the guidelines because you're practicing radiology within the confines of the radiological act and something if you're performing the red uh, the radiograph because it is justified that it will be a net of net benefit to the patient then that is good but if uh, it is being performed simply because the insurance company has said it must be performed then i would say that is a misnomer and um i i, be, I, I would advise you to actually take the interests of the patient and yourself first because when you expose the patient, you are also exposed. Because think of all the scatter radiation in the environment. And uh, remember, you're doing this just because the insurance company has asked for it. And the other way we can mitigate this is also to come up with our own local guidelines. And I told you, we are busy working on that because we don't have guidelines from our setup. We are mainly borrowing from guidelines from the American and Canadian countries and all across Europe. But if we come up with our guidelines, this is one of the the things that we actually need to come to factor so that when you say no as a clinician, then there is a reference document that is governed by leg legislation that you can actually refer to. Okay, and um, there's a question here from uh, Dr. Nanji, and he says he has read somewhere that dental x rays have 60% diagnostic value. What are your thoughts on that? Sorry, 60% of what? 60% diagnostic value. 60% diagnostic yeah, value, yes. Well, I'm not sure where the 60% as a numerical value comes from, but I will agree that uh, radiographs cannot uh, be used uh, alone, like um, they are not cannot be used in isolation. And that is why you must correlate all radiographic findings to the clinical presentation of a patient because you cannot use dental radiograph in alone. That is why even a radiologist, if you confront me with a, a panoramic uh, X, uh, radiograph and you ask me, Dr. Okondo, what is this? I will probably have an idea. I think it might be ABCD, but I will always ask you, what did they present, uh, the patient present with? What is the clinical feature? What, uh, how long has this, uh, the patient had this problem? Because it helps me to be able to systematically formulate my diagnosis. So yes, X, uh, uh, radiographs do not give you an answer on, in isolation, like 100%. And so you must always correlate this with the clinical presentation of a patient in order to be able to get a better judgment. I hope I answer you. Yes, you, yes, yes, yes. So, I think we've come to the end of our of the presentation today. So for me, I have nothing much to say other than wow. Thank you, Dr. Opondo. 
that was quite informative and also very scintillating. So thank you again for taking time to prepare the presentation and also time to give it. So thank you on behalf of KAPD and everyone who attended today. I'd also like to, to thank everyone who attended today and uh, to tell you that the presentations will continue. So we have got another one for next Thursday. So thank you everyone. So I'd like to say good night to everyone and bye and thank you again for attending. So bye.